All right. Thanks for coming back for uh, part three of Everything Sad is Untrue. This is a story, a memoir, actually, um, about the life of Daniel Nyeri, the author, um, told from his um, perspective as a young child who is an immigrant to the United States, um, specifically Oklahoma, in the early 90s. Um, going back and forth between his time in Iran, where he, his homeland, where he was born, um, and his journey that led him to um, the United States. So we'll keep on um, going with this story. Thanks for being patient. Again, my disclaimer, I am um, looking up all the words to make sure that I'm pronouncing them correctly, but um, sometimes I'll slip up. So please forgive me if I do. All right, so at this point, Daniel has just had a misunderstanding with some people from church. He has um, gotten into an argument and he's actually broken his thumb. If I were Scheherazade, I would stop here and say, oh, great and clever king, except I'd say reader. I've never lied to you, even when a lie would serve me the humiliation of the truth. And then I'd skip over the part in the hospital when the doctor said, hold on, son, and snapped my thumb back into place. It's not lying if you leave it out. The next Sunday, the team of cowboys beat the dolphins. Wes never spoke to me again. Bobby said it was because I was probably one of those people who sue Americans for money and he had to protect himself. Pastor John Boy saw me in the church hall and said, whoa, guess we should call you lefty now. I didn't say anything, nothing I remember anyway. He grabbed my cast and said, here, let me sign it. I don't have any other memories involving these people, so you can forget them. The only reason I'm telling you this was that as John Boy tried to use a ballpoint pen to sign my cast, as he scraped back and forth over my wrist so he could write, go dolphins, I thought of Aziz and wondered what horrible thing she'd left out of her story. I thought maybe she'd had to go to the hospital to see her husband and his murderer was chatting with nurses in the hall. I don't know. There was so much left unsaid in her story that we saw playing in her eyes as she spoke only part of it. We don't know anyone our sadness. Bones break over and over and you can get used to it like Mithridates with his poison. You could even break your bones on purpose, put your arm in a drawer and slam it. Little by little, they still fuse back to stronger. Eventually, you might even become unbreakable. Just knowing they could never hurt you, that would scare people. Somewhere in their animal brains, they know you've become a different kind of creature. If anyone ever grabbed you, their fingers would shatter. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what about hugs? What about Mithridate's lonely curse? You might even say, we don't owe anyone our sadness, but the sharing of it is what friends do. It makes the sadness less. Friends don't care if you like the same football squad. And you're probably right, brilliant reader. You're right. I cried in the hospital when they pushed my hand in the x-ray table. And I cried again when they set the bone. And I cried the whole time Wes was pulling me off Bobby. I didn't understand any of it. I even cried when I threw away the hat. There is an American filmmaker named Orson Welles who said, if you want a happy ending, that depends, of course, on where you stop your story. And Dr. Hammond, pastor, not doctor, says, it's, um, it'll be all right in the end, folks. If it's not all right, then it's not the end, which means Dr. Hammond thinks the world is going to an, um, end at his birthday party. But my point is, don't worry, Scheherazade lives at the end of the thousand and first night. This is not a Persian love story anyway. It ends in America and it will have a happy ending. But this isn't the end. So Kosru and Shirin died bloody. Aziz became a widow and I spent a summer with a bag around my arm every time I showered. That's it. Those are the facts. Like I said, Ray wasn't around for a while because my mom divorced him after Pastor Hammond told her it was okay, that Jesus would forgive her because Ray had broken her jaw. And we went to live in an apartment complex behind a gas station where the kids would run up behind me and punch me in the ear on my right side where my cast was so I couldn't do anything about it. I got hit in the jaw about twice a week, but nobody ever broke it because none of them had a third degree black belt. 
A few months later, Ray went to Pastor Hammond and told him he was repented, which meant he was sorry. And Pastor Hammond told my mom she should marry him again because we didn't have any money and it was worse to Jesus if we were on government welfare. So that was the second time they got married in the pastor's office, and they didn't tell us about it until Ray started hanging around again. He just showed up one Sunday with the stuff to make his special Korean ribs, which had to be marinated for three days, so I knew he was planning to stick around. When he saw my cast, he said, what happened? While well, he grated an onion into a bowl. I got jumped, I said. I was holding the fridge open, but there wasn't anything to eat except food that I would have to warm up in the microwave behind Ray. He got jumped, he said. He laughed, maybe because it sounded like I was in an action movie or something. He didn't know there were three of them. I told him I was trying to get my cap back and the big, bigger kid got on top of me and yanked till he broke my thumb. I tried to make it sound like I hadn't used any martial arts so he'd keep teaching me. He just said, wow. Over dinner three days later, they told us they were back together and that we were all moving into a house that was when I learned if you can't fight, you don't get a vote in anything. Counting the memories. Grandma Ellie, the exile. Aziz and Hassan had a daughter before he died. That girl grew up to be my grandma Ellie, who plotted to kill her husband and was exiled to England. I met her there once and discovered that kitty bix and peanut butter is a good breakfast. My only memory of her is early in the morning in her apartment in London. She's smiling and reaching out to take my box of kitty bix. Cosy, she says, that's cat food, and she laughs. But first, let me finish Aziz. In any story, the two hardest things to be are a widow or an orphan. Those are the bad cards to draw from the deck marked life. Because those are the two moments the people you love the most die. It's heartbreak, heart shatter, heart starve. It's so much loss that it's easier if you just died and started the game over, but you can't. You have to wander. Part of it is losing your tribe and being homeless. Part of it is being alone in the dark. I won't lie to you. The deck mark life is stacked full of bum cards. Aziz was both an orphan and a widow, and the dark nights must have seemed unbearably long, long enough to lose every memory and become a blank-faced animal. But every good story has a turn and a twist. The deck has a joker in it. The turn for Aziz came two years after Hassan died. She met and married a man named Agha. He adopted her daughter and he loved Aziz and they all lived happily until their daughter grew up and got married and had kids of her own. But here's the twist. That daughter was 13 when she got married. That's a seventh grader. And Agha wanted his own kids eventually, but they couldn't have any when they tried. They went to the physician who had a good relationship with Agha uh, and who didn't even remember Hassan. He told them they would need a fertility test. Aziz wanted to spare Agha the humiliation. And so she said, it's me, I'm barren, it's my fault. She assumed Agha would say, no, no, that's impossible. You already had a daughter, of course it's me. But he didn't. He sat in the physician's office, blank faced, red in the cheeks, he said, I want a divorce. And suddenly, Aziz was in a room with the man who took her first husband from her and the one who took her second. The word Agha had used, Setalagesh, was the kind of divorce reserved in Islam for men who have threefold anger. Men so angry, they would never regret the decision, never return or remarry their old spouse. That was the twist, I guess. The twist is sometimes a knife. Aziz was alone again, this time for the rest of her life. When she was very old, she married again for companionship. He was the one who liked sesame candy, but never ate it because he was bedridden. And so by the time I met Aziz, she was the old woman who offered stale candy and whose house smelled like sadness. She would play love songs she used to listen to with Agha or Hassan, I don't know, and cry. I would run out to the little river. She would shut herself off from the world. And if you listened real hard for the sound of far off girls laughing as they returned from the saffron harvest, you wouldn't hear it. It was too far away. All my grandma, all my life, my grandma Ellie, Aziz's daughter, my mom's mom, has lived in England. The legend was that her husband, my grandpa, forced her to go or else he would kill her. His name was Armand and I have zero memories of him. Not one.
I can bring up his face in my mind, but only because my mom had a picture of him in her shoebox while we were escaping Iran. When we would look through it, there was always the one of him, not with his kids, not even with the new wife he had had at the time, a woman whose name I don't know. The photo is just Armand from the waist up. It's black and white. His skin is a light gray. He is very thin. His lips are thin too. His nose is thin and pointy. He is bald and unsmiling. His eyebrows are thick and corded. His eyes look directly at the camera, impatient, as if he has some place to be. Once, a long time ago, he killed a bunch of kittens in a burlap sack, probably threw them into a river because the family couldn't keep them. My mom told me this story to make him seem like a responsible person who had suffered under the weight of his obligations or something. That's the best she could do. I said, he looks really mean. No, she said, not like she disagreed, but that she shouldn't say such things about elders. No, she said again, but it was obvious she didn't have any evidence. He worked very hard, she said. That was all she could come up with. And he wanted all his kids educated. That was very important, which if you know my mom, you know is a case for him being a villain. All her life, she wanted to be a farmer. His pressure made her go to med school. But whatever, she tried to defend him. The problem was, you'd look at the picture of his pursed lips and cruel eyes, and you knew the whole story. He was a very important man, a governor. He, ha he was only 17 when he married Ellie, who was 13, so he had to work hard to grab power. Good for him, I guess. At one point, the four kids, my mom was the second, had a cat named Sherry that my uncle Salim loved more than anything or anyone in the world. He was young then, and Sherry, who was a boy cat, would wander at night. One morning, Sherry was at the door with another cat, this one trailed by a bunch of bleary kittens. Salim saw them and immediately adopted all of them. And at this point, Ellie was probably around 23 and Armand 27, and they already had four kids, and the one cat. So it was already a crowded situation. But then one day Sherry got sick and their dad took him to the vet. The vet told him the cat wouldn't get better and would probably cause infection in his human kids. So he put all the cats in an empty sack of rice. He drove them outside of town, said my mom, but they came back the next day. She paused there. Here, <clears throat> to her, the picture of Armand came with a thousand memories. She seemed to admire him. He never said a word against, she never said a word against him, even though, trust me, he looked like he would kill the cameraman if the picture took one more second to take. So he drove them to the creek and put them in the sack. Geez, I said, so she wouldn't finish. He came back. That was the first time she ever saw her dad cry. He said he shouldn't have done it. We would have been cursed forever for hurting the Muslim creatures. And they were. Salim didn't even know he had been injured, but he was never again whole. They just told him that their cats ran away. I guess if you think regretting it makes Armand a nice man, then this story works for you. I don't have an opinion because I don't have a memory of my own. He's just a picture my mom likes to stop and stare into. The difference between him and my Baba Haji is exactly one memory. Those are my two grandfathers. And the space between zero and one is all the world and everything in it. So they aren't exactly neighbors in my head. For my next report on Robert Frost, I will count the memories of my uncles. Please note, Mrs. Miller, that the connection to the assignment is that it involves two roads diverging not in a yellow wood, like in Frost's poem, but someplace else. But that's a really good A-plus connection. There are so many people in your life that you've only kept one for one memory. Think about them. That person with scars you've never seen before, or the teacher you never had who yelled at you once in the halls. And there are single memories you have of people you never met, like the bad guy in Terminator 2, or people who visit churches in the summer and give testimonies about China. I have three uncles on my dad's side and two memories between them, which means I have more memories of John Boy, the pastor's son, than all my uncles combined. One memory is my dad's youngest brother, Reza, who had such red hair and so many freckles that he was probably a descendant of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan had red hair, look it up. I remember riding on the front of his motorcycle, barreling down the dirt road to Artistan. So fast we would hit bumps and fly in the air. 
On a straight part, he let me hold the handlebars and let he let go. I screamed. He laughed in my ear, a laugh I will never forget. That laugh is the heart of the memory. I knew I was safe. Back then, Reza didn't have any kids. I remember the dirt road, his laugh, the hot bike underneath me. I remember we came up to a cross road and sand everywhere, the outline of two intersecting roads, no signs. When I see it in my mind, it is just us, nothing else in a vast desert, two roads, sand. I remember he said, Kosi, you pick which way. And I don't remember anything after that. Not the direction we went, not the trees popping up as we approached an oasis village, not even a second thing Ressa said. I just remember he let me pick and that the road led in completely opposite directions. My mom would have probably scolded me for letting me hold the handlebars, but that's not something I kept. If we had stayed in Iran, I think Reza would have been my number one best friend. And the other uncle memory is the time my dad and his brother-in-law, sister's husband, took my pheasant hunting, took me pheasant hunting when I was four. His name was Oscar, but you can call him Oscar in your head if you want. The forests along the edge of Artistan are full of foxes, owls, rabbits, and pheasants. There are also leopards, which is why I begged to go with them, and also because they were doing manly things. I don't remember much about Oscar, except that he looked like my dad, but he was half a hand shorter, half a size smaller, half as educated, and half as friendly. Looking back, my dad was like the Pokemon Oscar evolved into. But Oscar lived in Artistan every day while my dad had moved to the city of Isfahan to be a doctor. So Oscar had all the latest gossip from the village and helped Baba Haji pen the goats and carry the pomegranate bushels. Even though my dad grew up in those woods, Oscar knew the best part of the woods to find pheasants. I don't remember how the trip began, only that my mom objected. Ach, Masood, he's four. Let him come, this is good for him. Madam Doctor, Oscar would say, using the two most respectful words he could possibly use to honor my mother. I will take care of them. We won't even leave the car, my dad said. The next part of the memory jumps directly into my dad's gold Chevrolet. I'm seated in the back and my mom is leaning all the way in through the window, squeezing my neck. Be careful, my sweet Muslim boy, she says. Ach, Sima, he's not going to war. She sucks her teeth because even saying such a thing, heaven forbid. She kisses my face 57 times until I shout. Then she gives me a cardamom pound cake with slivered almonds on top. It's the size of a brick wrapped in foil. The memory jumps again to the Chevrolet grumbling down a dirt road lined on both sides with beeches and mulberry trees. A mulberry wood is the kind of place the animals have names and jobs and go on storybook adventures. My dad parked in the middle of the road. We were miles into my grandfather's land and no one else would drive up from either direction. We watched the hedgerow and waited for pheasants to show their speckled tails. They started talking. I have no idea what about. Grown-ups will talk sometimes in boring words about boring ideas to groom each other like apes to let each other know they're pals. Something about that early morning, the way the sun made everything bright and golden, it looked like a kid had colored the world, unafraid to use every pencil in the box. I watched and listened as closely as I could. You could hear the hedgehogs scrappling, scrabbling into their nests. My dad reached back sometimes and I gave him a chunk of the dense cake. When they saw a family of pheasants, my uncle propped a rifle out of the window of the Chevrolet and shot. The bang wasn't very loud. The trees ruffled, the other pheasants flew off, one dropped. For a while, the woods quivered. We stayed in our car until the air was still again and the pheasants came back. Then my dad took a turn. I asked, will there be leopards? Maybe, my dad said, keep looking. I squinted at every dappled leaf in the mulberry wood, hoping to see leopard eyes looking back. Imagine how unlikely it is for two creatures of any kind to see each other through the shadows of the woods, eyes connecting, attention ready. For a moment like that, all the universe would have to conspire to move all its pieces and line them up just so. I think a person gets seen 
really looked at, looked into, seen the way a leopard would see into you maybe 10 times in their entire life. And even then, who knows what a leopard would be thinking. After three or four pheasants had fallen into the hedges, I said, can I try? I had spotted all the ones he shot before, so I was already involved. My dad sucked his teeth. He could hear my mom, my mother probably. Let him, said my uncle. My dad nodded. Back then I wanted to be exactly like my dad. I gave him the cake to hold because we still needed a snack, chief. My uncle, Oscar, turned around and adjusted the rifle so that it rested on the shoulder of his seat and still pointed out of his front window. He held the barrel and the stock. Okay, put your finger here, but don't pull. I focused my vision to the end of the barrel. In the woods, I could hear the rustling of wings. Sometimes the pheasants would perch on the lower branches of trees. Look through there, said my uncle. I scanned the trees. A speckled lump sat in the crook of a tree. I pulled the trigger and fell back in my seat. It was the loudest noise I'd ever heard. The lump dropped from the branch. My dad and uncle cheered. My champion, said my dad. Oh, one shot. You earned our dinner, said my uncle. I knew what it must sound like to you. I know what it must sound like to you, but I was super proud. What a son you've got, said my uncle, and my dad agreed. Hunting isn't a sin if it's useful. If you're feeding people, which is what good men do. We got out of the car to collect our trophies. From the window, it was just a video game on TV. Everything looked different when we got outside. The hedgerow was thorny, and I was too small to push past it, so I ran along the gully on the side of the road and watched my uncle march into the wood. Somehow, he had memorized the location of every drop. Mine was the farthest, which meant I had made the hardest shot. Come on, come on, I said. When he came to the last one, I heard him stop short. Oh, no, he said. Masood, over here. Is it a good one, I said. My dad picked through the patches and stopped beside my uncle. They were both looking at the ground. My dad sighed. Let's leave this one, he said. I ran into the ditch and threw the thorny hedge to where they stood. At their feet was a baby owl with my bullet in it. Its other eye was still open. We looked at each other. Can you imagine how unlikely it is for any two creatures to cross each other in a universe as big as this one? There is no telling what it was thinking, but it looked at me as though to say, there is no eating a baby owl. That's not useful like a hunting a pheasant. On the ride home, I cried in the back of the car, but quietly so the men wouldn't hear me. That's the end of that memory. It's the only one I have of Oscar. How disappointed he was, frowning at the dead bird. Anyway, I told you all this because killing owls is no different than killing kittens. In case you thought I was putting myself above anybody, I'm not above anybody. That was the second innocent thing I killed, if you count the bull. And that was before I ever turned five. Oklahoma is the only state in the Union where it is legal to own an anti-tank sniper rifle. It shoots bullets the size of milk cartons, and if you hit a deer with it, all you leave is red mist. Of my grandparents, my grandma Ellie was the least likely to kill any animals. She always had a princess quality about her, which is to say people talked about her like she was spoiled. I don't know what it was would be like to be 13 and married. I guess one thing it makes you is scared all the time that everyone will hurt you. Even as she got older, people said she acted like a kid, though only about her own problem, thought only about her own problems and wasn't very mother-like. I didn't have any stories about her early life. Nobody ever described the wedding. A little girl in a room full of grown men wondering which one is her husband. My mom just sighs and said, it was a different time. And he was a young man, but nobody's convinced, not even her. What else is there to say, though? It happened. Welcome to Earth. Armand, the pinched grandfather I told you about from the picture, her husband was a bad husband who was known as the governor and governed mostly a bunch of affairs with other women. Ellie took more damage than an Oklahoma trailer park in a tornado, and people still blamed her for retreating into the bomb shelter of her own mind. Those are the only facts I know. Child, bride, horrible husband. I could live a thousand years and they'd still be the only parts I know for sure. 
The bones of the divorce are that they had four kids, grew apart, and divorced. The rest of the story I only ever heard through the cracks of doors as my aunts whispered to each other um, over tea years later in places like Toronto, London, and Edmond after they had survived it all and could safely compare their experiences. Every side of an explosion looks different. If you're looking at a bull collapsing to the ground and I'm beside you looking at it, we're seeing two bulls die, two rivers of blood, two everything. That's why there's an infinite labyrinth of stories, even in just one family. The story I heard was that Armand became, became a governor of a town near Tabriz, a little town where he was a big man. They lived in a house with an open porch where my mom studied and where her younger brother would use a piece of broken gutter to reach the apples on the trees in the next yard and twist them from the branches so they would roll down into his bag. My grandfather was the kind of man who had goons, bigger guys in suits that don't fit with sweaty stains up their backs. He was good looking back then, I assume, because the only thing I ever heard about him was that women liked him. Maybe in a different version of the story, he would be the one who gives me advice about how to impress Kelly J. In that version, he's my grandfather, the sophisticated charmer who wore silk jackets and taught me how to wink like a cool guy. One thing about being a refugee is that you lose those little lessons and you have to teach yourself everything to yourself. Ellie was only 20 something and had four kids to worry about. So she didn't know how know that even husbands don't take showers in their offices in the middle of the day or that governors don't have to work late nights. Basically, he was going out and winking at other women and they would wink back and no one told Ellie because he was powerful. Ellie had a lot of sadness in her life, sadness of the kind that makes perfectly normal people into poets. After dinners, the family would sit in the open terrace with bowls of dried apricots and pistachios, sugar candies, and big samovar of uh, black tea. Armand would be uh, off somewhere. Ellie would write poems about the night air under the oil lanterns, and the children would sit beside the cherry tree. Her oldest daughter, Soraya, was nearly in college. Seema, my mom, was in high school. Both were straight-A students. The brother, Salim, would be in town with other boys making a kite out of butcher paper, glue, and hand-carved branches. And Sanaz, the youngest, the last daughter, at 11 years old, was the baby. Does writing poetry make you brave? It's a good question to ask. I think making anything is a brave thing to do. Not like fighting brave, obviously, but a kind that looks at a horrible situation and doesn't crumble. Making anything assumes there's a world worth making it for, that you'll have some place like a clown's pants to hide it when people come to take it away. I guess I'm saying making something is a hopeful thing to do and being hopeful in a world of pain is either brave or crazy. Later in her life, Ellie would go crazy. She believed mysterious people were trying to kill her with alien sound wave machines, so she would sleep in a tool shed to hide herself. But for now, she was brave. I always imagined the man she met was a librarian of the village with a library so old it had a signature in one book from Esther in the Bible, who would go on to become a queen. But no one ever said his name or his job. It's just what I like. The villages where he lived, or the village where he lived is a real place where the houses are carved into stone that bulge out of the ground as if a volcano had bubbled up the earth and hardened into giant pillars. Maybe he lived in a different village, doesn't matter. <clears throat> I'll describe the cool one. Imagine colorful wooden doors in odd shapes and windows at wonky angles embedded into the rock. Sometimes the top of one house has a rickety bridge to the balcony of another. It's a stair-step bunch of cave homes stacked around each other and carving along the windowsills is a little river like a stone gutter winding through the entire village. Sometimes it goes into the house where you could wash your hands in the constant flow of cold mountain water. Sometimes it makes a tiny waterfall cascading next to a dirt staircase leading down to a new terrace of homes. I imagine if you were a kid with a friend, you could make a paper boat and write a secret message on it 
then you could go to your window and set the boat in the water and watch it float away in the channel past all the other houses. And you could shout, hey, Ali, look. And your friend, his name would be Ali, would run to his window just in time to retrieve the boat and he'd get your message. Ali is a dog, son. Want to play ball? In the lumpy village of doors and windows carved out of rocks, there would be one tall pillar like a lighthouse with a door so narrow you could only pass through sideways and green window shutters with irregular slats all around it. Inside would be a spiral staircase around a stone column. As you went up, carved into the column itself would be shelves where books were stacked by the dynasty in which they were made. You could go backward in time, so the first floor would have the current century. That shelf would have the tea glass and the tray with paper clips and rubber bands because literature has not been the focus of this dynasty. But you could climb up and reach the Pavlovi. And then the first big shelf of American dynasty writers like Stan Lee, then Britain, J.R.R. Tolkien, and then France, Alexander Dumas. As you climbed the stairs around and around, the outer windows would shine colored light through their stained glass. Then finally, on the shelves for the uh, Salju Turks in the 13th century, you'd find the poet Rumi, who said, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. And Attar, who wrote the Confederate of the Bird, the Conference of the Birds. The next shelves would have Ferdowsi of the Abazid Empire, the father of the language in which I dream. If it wasn't for him, my dad says, we wouldn't have any Farsi. Look at Egypt. Look at Syria, he says. They don't speak Egyptian anymore. They don't speak Syrian. After the Muslim conquest in the years around 750 AD, they all switched to Arabic. But not us, my father says to me over the phone, because we had the Shanama for Dowsi's epic poem. We had that and could hear the beauty of the Vers Persian language. He told all the history of the Persian people back until it blended into legends and then myths. All of it, it's there. Above the Shanama, Shanama near the top of the tower library, would be the shelves for Ibn Sina, the father of modern medicine. He was the guy who wrote the properties of things like how aloe smooths skin uh, and ginseng gives you focus. It was like alchemy back then, but later people realized it was the first book of medicine. This is why it was so easy for my mom and dad to become doctors like Avicenna, because your blood is a very complicated river of information inside every part of your body. And it carries things you would never believe from generation to generation. And the last shelf in the cramped peak of the tower where the stairs end and a tiny window looks out into the window, into the village and hill country beyond are a few pages from the lost book of Persepolis, the city of Kings. This was the city that was burned by Alexander the Great during the Archimenid dynasty 300 years before Christ. Back then, it was the richest city in the world. Now, if you visit, it's a pile of stones that only museum people care about. On the stone, there's still writing that says stuff like, I am Xerxes, king of the kings, ruler of all that you see before you as if you should be impressed because back then you would have seen a shiny kingdom, but now you see a colossal wreck on a dirt burger. The library was destroyed and so Persian literature doesn't go back much further than that. They say Alexander the Great saw what his soldiers had done to the city and regretted it, but that's like breaking someone's bones and then saying you're sorry. Anyway, in the village of the Wibbly Wobbly, in the town, <laughs> Anyway, in the library tower of the Wibbly Wobbly Village, dug into the rocks, there might have been a librarian. He's the guy I made up to fall in love with Ellie. I guess he could have been from a city and sold motorbikes or something, but Ellie was a poet and she never chose her husband and never even grew up to decide what kind of stuff she liked as an adult or dated anybody with the same interests. So I just imagine Kava the all-alone librarian of Candovan 
who was as tall and thin as his tower and moved like a cat and sat in the light from the window at the top of the stairs to read and remember the kings. Stay with me on this one. In Oklahoma, they call fruit leather fruit roll-ups, which isn't fruit and doesn't feel like leather. The flavors are sour blue or cough syrup, and the shapes are Ninja Turtles. My mom won't buy us any because she says it's nothing but sugar mixed with chemicals to make it neon colors, and it'll give you cancer. I think it's just because we can't afford it. In Iran, the number one snack is fruit leather made by humans. I had some at school once, and Jared S. said, why is it so brown? Because dried fruit is brown, not pineapple. If you just dry it without chemicals, it turns brown. Not mangoes? Yeah, mangoes. Not apricots? I'm honestly impressed with how many fruits Jared S. can name since he eats all of his in gummy form. In any Persian market, you can get cherry leather or black currant, but people make their own and villages have special combinations like apple pomegranate or plum lime, which is like sour blue, but not blue and can give you and not give you cancer. Tamarind is the best flavor. It is very sour and very brown. Jared S. says it looks like the crap they use for catfish bait, but I'm not friends with Jared S. In my mind, Kava, the librarian, would sit in his library with a book in his lap and a stack of fruit leather next to him like sheafs of paper. It wouldn't spill on anything, and he could keep it shelved in between the covers of a book that had no pages after an imam had torn them out for offending Allah. On every shelf, he had one, a book with fruit leather pages. I imagine Ellie entered on a Tuesday night after school started and people went to work. It's not gross to say she was pretty because I'm Scheherazade and not her grandson right now. And everyone agreed she was very pretty and cautiously curious and educating herself one book at a time. At that moment, Kava was reading a line in a poem. The seed of a pepper, black. The mole on this lip of a lover, black. Both burn at the touch, but the first is one thing and the other another. He looked up from his book saw her at the bottom of the stairs and said, oh, as if he suddenly understood. Welcome, he said. I'm looking for a book, she said. How can I help you, he said. I'm looking for a book, she said. Yes, sorry, what book, he said. Poetry, she said. Havez, Nisami, not poems, how to write poetry. You write, he said. I try, she said. Here's one, he said. How much, she said. One poem, he said. She didn't say anything. I was only joking, he said. This is a library. I thought it was a store, she said. Yes, I figured. You don't owe me anything. Please take it. She took it and walked out. He said, I love you. I love you. I love you, in his head. The next week, maybe, she returned with a poem written on a cream-colored sheet of paper. It was not about him. It was about books but it talked about books as if they were couples lined up beside each other as if they were standing for wedding photos. And the only trouble was that a book is shelved with a lover on either side. And how would anyone know the right place? Pairs. It's beautiful, he said. I think it's tragic, she said. Yes, he said, but it's also true. In Muslim Iran, it would be a scandal for a man to spend any time alone with a woman, even in a library, but Ellie was a governor's wife and not always obedient. She would knock on the crooked door in the mornings. They would sit in the alcoves of each floor reading to each other and eating sheets from the book of fruit leather. They consumed the pages and were consumed by ideas, sour pomegranate, sour description or sweet descriptions of kissing sweet mulberry, sour passages of death. Sometimes she would put her head on his shoulder after a poem about birds or something and cry inconsolable tears. Ellie had four children, a husband, parent, parents, cousins, friends, but felt very alone at this time and grown out of season. And sometimes you fall in love that way when you're drowning in a world of pain. It's not a happy love. It's just whoever manages not to hurt you all the time. You think they must be the best the world has to offer. The little window of time you aren't in pain can seem like happiness. But I think Ellie and the librarian in the Tower of Stone were in real love. 
somehow in all the world with all the people in it, in all their wonky shapes, they were shaped to fit each other and they found each other born in the same country, how lucky, and both loved poetry and fruit snacks. And like poetry, they felt their hearts expand infinitely in all directions when they were together so that it was possible to forget all the pain in their lives and the world, or at least to endure it as long as they could be together. Maybe that was it. I made all that up. The only part anyone told me was that Ellie found a lover. They decided to kill her husband and run away together. I'm embarrassed to admit that I wrote a poem for Kelly J for Valentine's Day. Not embarrassed that I wrote it, but embarrassed that I gave it to someone so mean. It said, if she wanted, we could read together. I would feed her tamarind fruit leather. And to me, she was a seed of black pepper. Kelly J is the kind of person who would give private letters to her friends to laugh at during our hour in the library, which doesn't have any books about any Persian stories anyway. There is a book on animals. It has a page on Persian cats. And there are definitely no books full of fruit leather. That's too much to ask of any place in the real world. When I tell people my stories about the hero Rastam or the size of pomegranates from the orchards on my Baba Haji's land, the villages in stone pillars, auric candy bars, or anything that happened to me, they never believe me. There is no evidence in their library. They think I'm one of the poor kids trying to say I used to be rich, but I was. I know it's crazy that the kid in Oklahoma on welfare who barely spoke English at first used to be a prince. I know, but I did. I had a Nintendo and uncles and tons of store-bought snacks, a house that smelled like flowers all the time with birds in the walls and a pool. I wasn't always poor. Other kids don't know that. They think I'm lying. And if you tell any somebody that you're they're lying all the time, they start to believe you a little. They start to question their own memories because they're so different than anything happening around them. They think maybe I was a little, uh, maybe I was always smelly. Maybe I never had anything like a dad. Maybe I'm going crazy like Ellie after her exile, making up stories to feel better about myself. Maybe it would be too painful to live otherwise, but I don't think so. I close my eyes and squeeze tight my grip on the memory of my Baba Haji, smiling, reaching to squeeze my face in his bloody hands. If you could see it like I do, how proud he was that I was his, you'd feel so good that a grandpa like that loved you. Maybe you'd never cry again. The version they tell me goes, Ellie fell in love. Her lover had no name. They tried to kill her husband, my sister once whispered to me. She was talking about our grandpa. On Tuesday nights when international Bible studies of the University of Central Oklahoma could meet, my sister and I sat in the corners of dark church buildings. Ray was the pastor and everyone else was Korean. We were the only kids and could find crackers or candy no matter how well hidden in the cupboards. The TVs never worked. The ping pong tables never had balls. We wandered the halls quietly, or my mom would come out and shush us with eyes gigantic like, don't make him angry. Ellie and her lover tried to kill her husband, my sister said. Don't say that. They did. I mean, call him boyfriend or something. Ellie got him to sneak into their house to shoot him. Why didn't she just shoot him herself, I said, because that's a boyfriend's job. I wouldn't shoot anybody for a girl, I said, even though if Kelly J asked me to, I would step on a spider. My Baba Haji killed a bull for me, so maybe love is always measured by what you're willing to kill. Ellie's boyfriend must have loved her a ton. For Kelly J, I would also put out traps for mice and catch fish for food. So what happened, I said. Grandpa Armand was a governor, so he had men to protect him. Goons. Ellie was waiting at the train station with one suitcase. Everything she wanted was in it. Not any of her kids, just stuff. The train station smelled like roasting pistachios from the old Turkish merchant outside and burnt rubber from the trains breaking. She must have imagined her boyfriend would come running just as the train was about to leave and they would jump aboard and go somewhere. Maybe all she packed was books and fruit leather. Where did they think they were going? I used to wonder. 
possibly it didn't matter. A castle in the clouds of the Caspian Sea, a village above a lake suspended on giant Persian rugs, a house beside a river of rot. They didn't care. Escape was all that mattered. Ellie clutched her bag and refused a newspaper from a kid and watched the main entrance by the ticket counter. She hoped Kava would find Armand alone, and she hoped whoever found Armand's body would be the one of one of his goons and not one of his children. It was almost dinner time, and people would be wondering where she was. She sat on a long wooden bench and couldn't think of any word that described her anymore. When she looked up again from her watch, a man with a buttoned-up shirt stretched over his belly stood in front of her. Her armpits were soaked with sweat. His armpits were soaked with sweat. He had a waxy bag of roasted pistachios from the old Turk outside. Are you Mrs. Piruzka? he said. He snapped open a pistachio shell and popped the nut into his mouth. Yes, said Ellie. Armand's wife, he said. He asked if he already didn't believe her. Yes. I was sent to tell you he's dead, said the goony man. Armand? No. Your other one, her librarian. Ellie's mind might have broken right then. No one knows, but she was never again completely sane. She half heard the steam whistle blow and half watched the train pull out of the station. The man waited for her to see the last car pull away from the platform, the last hope that the story would end happily. He let the pistachio shells fall to the ground. When it was quiet again, he said, the boy is dead. Maybe they even burned his library, but he was definitely dead. You'll never see his face again. Ellie had nowhere in the entire world at that moment to be and not be alone. Even the nook of a tree can make you feel safe if you hide yourself in it. Somewhere in some dark gully in a black back corner of a village, her beloved Kava lay slaughtered blood flowing from his neck for stray dogs to lick at until it turned brown. The goony man put his wet paw on her shoulder and she realized she'd been vibrating. She jerked away from him. If he touched her again, she'd scream. He said, Arma Khan, her husband, says he won't hurt you, but you can't live here anymore. My sister explained that what he meant was that Ellie would be exiled to England. She would have to take Sanaz, her younger daughter, her youngest daughter, because she was 11 and Armand didn't want to be responsible for her. She was already packed, I pointed out to my sister. When did Armand say when she went back to get, what did Armand say when she went back to get Sanaz? What did they tell Sanaz or the others? No one ever told us. It was just exile. Stop talking about it. Probably a million trains have gone back and forth on that platform since then. Why did she keep his name, I asked. If they got divorced and if she tried to kill him and if he banished her from Iran, why did she keep his name? I don't know, said my sister. Maybe they never got divorced. We drank the grape juice they, they used for communion from the church fridge. We could barely stay awake. It was so late. The next day was a school day and we'd tell people we watched all the shows they were watching while we were at church. Then my sister said, divorce is a sin, you know, and I spit my juice out laughing. At school, I don't tell anyone about church. At church, I don't tell anyone about home. The neighborhood kids don't know anything about anything else. The trick is to keep your stories to yourself so they can't be used against you. My best friend is really good because all he talks about are the dolphins and video games. So we talk all the time, but he doesn't even know what refugees are. I'll tell you about him later because I think you and me are friends now. You know every memory I have of all my grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. You've got them all. You can probably count them yourself. And they're so fuzzy to you as they are to me. You won't clench them like I do, that's for sure. To you, they might even be junk. In the movies, kids get fishing trips with their grandpas and grandmothers give them hugs. Maybe my memories are only worth a couple peach pits to you, but you've got them now. All the pieces are in place for you to understand what happened and how we ended up in Oklahoma. If you've been listening this far, then maybe you won't laugh or call me a liar. When I tell you what happens next, you'll see how everyone played their part. It's not so hard to believe if you've got the memories I've got. 
and only a few moments would be something you might have to call mythical. You don't even have to believe those parts if you don't want to, but they're all true, so I think you should. Because you and I are friends, I'll tell you a full day of my life in wondrous Edmond, Oklahoma, the jewel of the I-35 roadway. It's always the same story, but it happens a thousand different ways. I wake up most of the time super late because I secretly stay up till 4 a.m. and because bus 209 has Brandon Goff in it. So I, so far I've missed more days of the my first hour class than I've attended. My mom works different jobs. Sometimes she won't even tell us what she's doing. For a while, she was in a factory that printed business cards for people. She says a lot of people just make up degrees to put up by their names, but she has a real MD and PhD, and she's still stuck by a conveyor belt cutting big stacks of cardboard. I don't eat breakfast because I wake up so late. My mom runs in. Daniel, Kosru, wake up. Ugh, I say, because my mouth is as dry as a cardboard factory from eating bread all night. Bread is the only food I can take from the kitchen at 4 a.m. because the fridge door makes a loud noise when you open it, and our pantry is full of ingredients like dried lemons, rice, onions. The only snacks are the potato rolls my mom bakes and leaves on the counter. She puts sugar and cinnamon inside half of them for me, and those are always on top. So when I sneak into the kitchen, I don't even turn the light on. Anyway, she says, Ach, Daniel, Pasho, Pasho, which means, Ach, Daniel, get up, get up. I don't get up. You missed the bus. I get up. Get up, she says. What? Oh, no, did I miss the bus? I say, which is a Taekwondo move called deflection. My room has six books in it, and it has no beautiful rugs or pictures of fields, so I am no con of flowers. The carpet is shaggy, beige, and covers everything in the apartment like dead grass. There are a couple shelves where I keep porcelain animals and micro-machine cars and a lazy boy chair we got when the people in the apartment next door left it outside. In my closet are balls for sport I still don't know the rules to, a baseball glove that is hard, shiny leather. I've never used it because people tell me I should spit in it and grind dirt in there to break it in. I just play soccer instead. I get up and get my coat. I came up with a trick in America. You can shower at night and sleep in a set of those sweats from Sam's Club. I have five. If I wear the green sweatshirt, then I wear the green pants. So it's a fashion match and not weird. I used to have all the same color and Ashley said I was wearing the same thing every day. So the different colors are for Ashley's mental accounts. Then you wake up, you just need socks and you can go to school. My mom drives me. I know she's worried every day. I come home sometimes with a bruise on my face from Brandon Goff or mad because they said my egg sandwiches smell like swamp crotch and Ashley or Kelly or Stacy made a show of holding their noses as I walked by. And my mom doesn't know any of the rules. She doesn't know any of these people or what they want from us. She's just dropping her kid into some building full of strangers, hoping he doesn't come back bloody. The office ladies don't treat her like the other parents. They look at her straight in the face and speak slow and loud like she's a busted drive through Yes, we understand, Ms. They never say her name. They just look at a paper and cut it off. Ms. Ms. We understand he's late. That's an absence. Okay, can I? She doesn't know the terms they use. Can I clear him? You mean clear him from the absence? Yes. You can clear excused absences. Okay, I'd like, I'd like to. This isn't an excused absence. What is it? An unexcused absence. See what they're doing? Presenting the information in little bits so they can beat her with it. My mom tries to hold it in because otherwise she'd scream at the ladies in three different languages and they treat her like even more of an animal. Okay, says my mom, how do I clear an unexcused absence? You can't, she waits. Finally, the lady sighs super loud, like it's not her job to do any of this. It's just her job to eat cookies. She rolls her eyes. He needs a note from a doctor. Yes, says my mom. I'm his doctor. I'm sure you are, says the lady. We'll need the note on official stationery. My mom will get the note, but she'll have to beg a doctor in our Bible study for a notepad. 
This is ridiculous because she's a doctor and because she works in a notepad factory. She says, okay, thank you, and walks out. And the office ladies make that snort noise to each other. That means what a pain, right? You should know Mr. Natvold doesn't care that I missed his class with unexcused absences because I have 112 in his class because Tanner the tongue exploder takes up most of the class hour asking if the Hulk could beat up Superman. No, but he's green. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but Superman hates green. He hates kryptonite. That's what I said. Hulk want wins. No. Hey, yo, Mr. Nadvold, what's the periodic table of kryptonite? And then he farts at a Jennifer and that's class. So I show up and take the tests on Fridays and on the rest of the days, Tanner's got one less person to mess with. He grabs me when I'm not looking and rubs a sheet of paper on my forehead like he's giving me a noogie. And when it gets a spot on it, he waves it over his head and screams, I struck oil, grease in the Middle East. Everybody's face has oil on it. In my other classes, I make sure to answer all the questions. This is a good trick for friend making. Don't laugh. I'm not wrong about this. It's not that I think people will admire me and be my friend. But the trick is that in America, nobody wants to answer questions. When Mrs. Martz has a math issue, even if they know the answer, it's bad to answer. That's a nerd thing to do. Also, it's try hard, which is a thing that you are when you race to finish tests before everyone else. I'm not a try hard anymore, but I answer all the questions and then smile at a Jared or a Jennifer who's slumping in their seat like, don't worry, pal, I got this one. That's how to be in on it. Perform a service and say it's no big deal. Then people can see how chill you are. You can even answer to get the teacher to move on and then look around and wink like it's an inside joke. At lunch, I stand at the back of the cafeteria line, always in the very back. This is a different trick that has three benefits. First, all the rich, Matt's, Kelly J and Daniel W, the Daniel who was born a Daniel and whose mother is a teacher, bring their lunches. So they start eating and they're finished by the time the line is done. Second, if you're the last person in line, sometimes the cafeteria lady who goes to our church will give you more of the food that other kids didn't want, like extra green beans or two scoops of mashed peas. But the third trick is that if you stand at the back of the line and realize you don't have any money, you don't have to tell anyone. You can wait. Nearby, the packed lunches trade their pudding cups for string cheese. The cafeteria trays start to come out to find seats with their friends. The steam is still rising from the gravy. It's not brown jello yet. Some kids get their tray and then realize their card is out of money when they hand it to the lady who puts it in the punch machine, and that's the worst thing to do. They have to stop the line. The punch card lady's always the most angry. She snaps her fingers if you don't have your card ready when you're up. Her eyes are always squinting behind her glasses, and if the card is empty, she groans and then looks around and shouts, I need an AP, which is an assistant principal to come and take the kid out of line. Everybody hears it and stops to watch. Once it happened to Nick, who is the dirtiest kid in school. Not very big, red hair. He lives in the same apartment complex as me, but his mom smokes. The assistant principal said, come on with me, Nick, we'll get you sorted out. And Nick followed her, but he brought the tray. So she turned around and said, oh, you can leave that. But Nick didn't want to. The punch card lady glared at him, leave it. Everybody in the whole cafeteria could see him. He couldn't take the food. Nick put the tray on the counter, but snatched the bread roll. The card lady said, hey, but Nick shoved it in his mouth. He looked like a hamster. The AP took him by the elbow and all the kids watched them leave. Daniel W knows all the teachers and grownups. So he has, the, he was the one to say thief as Nick walked by. I only ever got caught twice without money. They take you to the office where the ladies give you three saltine cracker sandwiches with peanut butter in the middle. They call your mother and say, his account is empty. You'll have to request the assistance program through the office. No, the district office. No, they only accept requests from our AP. It stands for assistant principal. Just send it to us and we'll take care of it. You're welcome. And they sigh again. The way they toss the bag of crackers at you makes you feel like the lowest thing in the world. 
it's against policy to make a kid go hungry, but you can tell you're not their guest. If you were a guest, you would be treated with kindness and tea and all the best food they could offer. Being generous to a guest is one of the most different things about these countries. In Iran, when a guest comes, you tell them they may be angels, they are welcome, and the whole house is filled with the joy of their presence, and the person always apologizing is the host that they might have more to offer. But here it seems guests are supposed to apologize all the time that they're taking every, anything. It's like they think the host is burdened. I don't understand it, but I know I never want to go to a house of any of these grown-ups who make you beg for so little. I don't want the cracker sandwiches they made with all the groaning in their hearts. I don't want to be poor. But if I can't have that, then I don't want to know how hungry, I don't want them to know how hungry I am. Anyway, if you stand at the back of the lunch line and you don't have any money in your account, you can wait and wait for the whole lunch period. And then just as you're about to grab a, a tray, ask to go to the drinking fountain. At the fountain, you drink a ton of water until you have to pee. Then you go to the bathroom. You have to stay there for 15 more minutes. You can wash oil off your face and fold paper towels into triangles. You could breathe on the mirror and draw something in the mist really quickly before it fades. Then lunch period is over and they don't know you haven't eaten anything. If you have a friend who leaves food on his tray, you can eat that before he throws it out. But I don't recommend that because even young people here think they're doing you a favor to feed you their trash. So just forget it and get in the line for recess. Recess is the time to mention Kyle, who is my great friend. I've never been to his house. He lives in Chimney Hill with the Jennifers and Daniel W. His dad painted his room the colors of the Dolphins team, and he has more games than I've ever seen in my life. Since I live in apartments, it's too dangerous for him to stay overnight with us. And my mom would be ashamed if I went to his house but couldn't tariff and offer hosting him in return. So we just play at recess. On the north grounds, we play dodgeball. On the south play playground, we sit on the roots of a huge tree and talk about football or final fantasy games. I break the acorns open and stuff the bitter nuts into nooks of the tree trunks so the squirrels won't go hungry. Kyle and I met because he was new and the new kid after me, so he didn't know anything about me before I could be nice to him. Sometimes I'll hear a good yo mama joke and write it in my notebook. Sometimes Kyle will draw monsters in his notebook. I told him once that Ifrit is a Persian monster, the one from Final Fantasy, he says. And I said, yeah, I mean, that one's a fire Ifrit. There are all kinds. Like there's genies, basically, and, ge and demons. But in our stories, the demons aren't all the same. There are some they call the demons who believe in God. And those are tragic figures because they made the mistake of siding with Satan when he rebelled against God. But as soon as they were smashed down to earth, they regretted it and believed again. But it was too late. They were already cast out. They just wander now and nobody believes that they want to be good because they look like hairy demons. And they don't have homes in heaven or hell. They're just always stuck and disbelieved. I realized I'd been talking for like 10 minutes because if I didn't explain everything, he'd think I was making it up. I had said in church once that there might be demons who believe in God, and that's what happened. Nobody believed me, so I shut up and went back to cracking acorns. Kyle said, cool, which was basically like saying he believed me. He drew the ifrit with a cross burned into his chest, and it was the coolest picture I'd ever seen. When the bells ring and everybody lines up to go back, Kyle and I get in different lines because we have all different teachers. We don't see each other after that. As we go inside, I usually make sure to be as far away from Brandon Goff as possible. If he sees Meg G first, he tells, your mama's so fat jokes. And if he sees me, he tells, your mama's so poor jokes. Looks like mama's so poor, she can't afford to pay attention. I'm not sure why that one's even funny. It's just true. She can't afford to pay attention. After school, they have clubs. I'm on academic team, Latin team and cinema club. 
It is important to have a classroom to go to when the last bell rings because that's when people fight the most in the halls and just behind the gym. Never be in the bathroom when school lets out, for example. I don't even know cinema. They're all movies from when Hollywood was called Tinseltown and they couldn't make explosions. I asked if we could watch a Van Damme movie and they said it was rated R. And also, I'm just the treasurer. They told me it wasn't a classic. I just go for the popcorn and wait till the coast is clear in the halls. Sometimes I sit with people after clubs while they wait for their parents to pick them up in their own cars. I have my notebook out to hear their jokes like, yo, give me a quarter. That's not a joke, but I notice they don't have shame in asking each other for money, so I write it down. There is a candy machine in, the, in every hall in the school, and some kids have money every day for a Coke, a pack of cookies, and either chewy candies or candy bars, all just for one kid. When they get fruit chews, other kids usually say, don't be stingy, I'll get you one back tomorrow, and the kid will give them one. I never say that because they know I'll never get them one back tomorrow. But sometimes they give me a yellow or a green, which are the trash flavors. I sometimes say no thanks so they don't think I'm a mooch. I just say nah, which is real cool like. I don't need it. And that wins respect so you can say yes next time. The lemons are really good too, so it's a good move. When their parents come, they sometimes lean over their kid and ask me, would you like a ride home? because they think I live close to them in one of their neighborhoods. But I said, nah, thank you, my mom's on the way. I walk home alone by the main road so the cars will see me. Sometimes the grown-ups driving by will call the police, but it's okay because I don't do drugs or spray paints or anything. Walking through the woods is more dangerous because there are no adults in the woods, just other kids, and kids are dangerous. On freezing days, I have to take bus 209, which is the bus that goes to the apartments, the trailer park outside of town, and all the way out in the boondocks. The farm kids on the bus are super tough and don't talk much and don't care about school at all. Meg G is twice as big as me and knows all about saddling horses. Her hands have rope burns from when she pulls in the steers. The Jennifers make fun of her all the time because she has a boy's haircut, but she's not a bad person. She even hit Brandon Goff in the face once. He was leaning over the seat of the bus laughing in her ear about her coat, which I always thought was cool. It's orange for hunting. He kept saying she was a big pumpkin, bumpkin pumpkin, and I don't think she would have ever done anything except he kept crackling in her ear until finally she smacked him right in the face really hard. It made a wet splat sound, and then she went back to being a stone. He even swiped at her head, but she didn't flinch, and he backed off because all his friends were laughing at him by then. When I get on the bus, I have very good strategies. First, I get on last. One time I got on first and took a seat by the window, and a kid named Harley crunched right on top of me and jammed my shoulder into the glass and said, I didn't see you there. That's okay, I said, because there was nothing else to say. You're in my seat. No one's ever in my seat, so I didn't see you there. I forgive you, I said. He smashed me again. The bus driver said, everything all right back there? We could see his eyes watching us in the big mirror above him. Harley said, yep, and sat next to me. Then for the rest of the ride, we both stared at the mirror. I tried to hold the driver's eyes as long as possible, but whenever he'd look down to make a turn or something, Harley would punch me on the thigh or the shoulder until I could only feel the throbbing where I hadn't gone numb. When we got to the trailers, <clears throat> he put his knuckle on my bruised leg and ground it in as I got up. I screamed and the bus driver looked up again, but it was too late. Harley said, my seat, and left. The next day, my leg was so purple it had patches of green in it. So I get on last and say hello to the bus driver so he'll like me and look at me as much as possible. Strategy two is that you can't sit up front which everybody knows because on a regular bus, it would make you a dweeb. And on bus 209, it will send you to the hospital. Once there was a kid whose name I don't know who sat in the front straight up like he was a first chair clarinet or something. It was like he just got to this country and didn't know any strategies. Brandon Goff only noticed the new kid after we left school. Brandon was all the way in the back, but it was still like putting a big juicy chicken in front of a cartoon fox. 
he quickly bent a paper clip in half so the two prongs stuck out. We call those wasps. And then he opened the bus window, put the two stingers on the lip and slammed it down so the prongs flattened into super sharp blades. We call those killer wasps. The kid had no idea what was about to happen. His posture was super good. I think he was probably on the wrong bus. Brandon slushed everybody, shushed everybody when they giggled as he took a thick rubber band off of his wrist. He put the killer wasp in it like a slingshot and pulled back so far I thought it would snap in half. I was in the middle of the bus looking to the front, <clears throat> back to front, waiting for this long seconds while Brandon aimed. It flew so fast I didn't actually see it. All I saw was the grin on Brandon's face, the snap of the rubber band, then nothing. Then half a paper clip just popped out of the kid's neck. The two prongs stabbed right in. No blood at first. Another second for the kid to feel it. Then he shrieked so loud that the bus driver slammed the brakes. We all flew forward. The kid clawed at the paper clip and ripped it out of his neck. That's when the blood came from the two holes and the driver called for help on the bus radio. We never saw the kid again. The image uh, we all remember is the little spray of blood from the holes like two little waterfalls just before he clutched them and fell over. The third strategy is to lean down and put your bag on your head. The fourth is to pick up your feet so they can't grab your ankles and right on your shoes. Five is don't sit in the very back. That's Brandon seat. Six is open the window in front of you for when they fart on you. Seven is don't open the window next to you so they can't throw your notebooks out. Eight is to cry if you have to. If they take pennies and flick them at your skull and say money for the poor and the pennies hit so hard your eyes go white and you fall over, then it's okay to cry to make them stop. That's all the strategies. Meg G and I sit next to each other and I hope someday she leaves school and wins 4-H and doesn't ever have to be around rich people or mall people again. <laughs>